Fantastic. So thank you so much for that introduction. As Beth said, I'm a fifth year doctoral student at the University of Washington in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. And my research is on pesticide exposure from our diets and trying to understand if there's a health effect from those low levels of exposure. So let's see. Um, this first slide will just be an overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I'm just going to start by defining organic food and getting us all on the same page about what the USDA means with the organic label. And then I'll talk a little bit about my background and my research and what brings me here tonight. And then I'll talk about what we know and what we don't know about the benefits of organic agriculture. So the regulatory body that's in charge of the word organic is the United States Department of Agriculture. And this is their definition of organic. They say that organic standards require the integration of cultural, biological, and mechanical practices, which foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Now, this is not the Environmental Protection Agency. This is the Department of Agriculture. I mean, the people that bring us the farm bill. This is pretty heady language from the USDA. Um, I mean, it sounds kind of like cows <laughs> playing harps in a field of butterflies to me. But what does it really mean? Well, mostly, it just means that there's stuff you can't use on your farm. So the things you can't use, first of all, synthetic fertilizers. So um, synthetic fertilizers are, for the most part, nitrogen-based fertilizers that are formed when you combine nitrogen from the air with hydrogen from fossil fuels. And so when people talk about, oh, organic agriculture, it uses less fossil fuels than conventional agriculture, it's not because the farmers in conventional agriculture are like driving their tractors around all day. It's actually because there's so much fossil fuel that goes into making most fertilizers. The USDA estimates that we apply 22 million pounds of fertilizer in the continental US in 2011 alone. So that's an amount of fertilizer that covers one eighth of the continental land mass. And most of that fertilizer isn't actually taken up by the crops that it's applied to. It runs off into waterways, it causes big algal blooms that starve the water for oxygen, and then we end up with these dead zones. So, for example, the Mississippi River feeds a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that covers between three and 8,000 miles, depending on the year and the time of year. But organic farmers still need to fertilize their crops. So what can they use? Well, they can use manure and compost. They can grow cover crops and till them under, so that adds nutrients to the soil. And they can rotate their crops, so they're doing different things at different times. And all of those things have the benefit of adding nutrients to the soil and preventing erosion. The next thing that you're going to have to give up if you want to grow stuff organically is sewage sludge. Sewage sludge is, as it sounds, the output from sewage treatment plants. So anything that anyone flushes down a toilet can end up in sewage sludge. Um, and what's great about sewage sludge is that it's free. So it used to be that we took all of our sewage sludge and we dumped it in the ocean. And that was great until we realized that we were creating these huge moonscapes of dead zones on the bottom of the ocean floor. <coughs> so in 1987, Congress passed the Oceanic Dumping Prohibition Act or something, and basically we couldn't do that anymore. And so in the early 90s, they came up with this great idea that what we would do instead is put it on our farmland. And the USDA actually encourages this as a good practice for conventional agriculture because it solves a lot of problems. But you can't do this in organic agriculture. So when we think about why organic food is more expensive, this is one of the first reasons. Synthetic fertilizers are cheap and sewage sludge is free. Whereas if you want to you know, grow a whole cover crop and then till it under, that's pretty expensive, relatively speaking. This one is near and dear to my heart. This is what I study, synthetic pesticides. You can't use most synthetic pesticides in organic agriculture. Um, and you can't use some natural ones too, like strychnine, arsenic, and lead. Um, and pesticides are a problem for the same reason as fertilizers. They don't stay where you put them. They run off into waterways, they get into our groundwater, and they hang out in our soil. 
So if you're an organic farmer, though, you still have to deal with pests and weeds. So what are you going to do? Well, you have some pesticide choices. You can use natural pesticides. Um, there's a really potent one that some people don't like, even in organic agriculture, which is pyrethrum. It's made from chrysanthemums, but it's still pretty toxic. You could also use insecticidal soaps. There's a bunch of oils you can use. You can use lures, traps, repellents. And then for weeds, you can mow them. You can put down plastic. You can graze your livestock. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and pick them. Um, so all that's expensive, too. GMOs. So no GMOs in organic agriculture. Anybody who was disappointed about the result of I-522 last Tuesday can know that there is a label out there that does mean GMO-free, and that's the organic label. Um, and this is not my area of study. I know it's a really hot topic right now, and we can talk about it more during the Q&A if we want to, but just know that there's no GMOs in organic food. And no ionizing radiation. So this is something that is sometimes done in produce production to kill off bacteria. And again, this is not really my area, and I'm not actually all that worried about it. Maybe I should be. But um, the people who do worry about it worry that it could mask spoiled food or discourage strict adherence to good growing practices. And these are all the things that you can't do when growing organic crops. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about tonight. So there's other rules about livestock. You can't use antibiotics or growth hormones. Um, but this is pretty much what organic agriculture is. So then I thought I'd talk a little bit about how that definition came to be. So in the late 1980s, a lot of farmers who were growing organic really wanted there to be a label that defined their product. Because at that time, the organic word was not really any different than like natural is now. It didn't have any particular meaning. And so they lobbied for an organic definition. And in 1990, Congress authorized the USDA to establish the NOP, the National Organic Program. Two years later, they met for the first time. <laughs> Five years after that, they came up with their first proposed rule, which received over a quarter of a million public comments. So it took another three years to integrate those comments and come up with a final rule. And then two more years after that, um, they started to actually certify farms, and you started to be able to find organic produce in your grocery stores. So just for the rest of my talk, when I talk about what research there is about whether organic food is healthy, keep in mind that you know, this was only 10 years ago. It took more time to write the rules than the food has even been sold in our grocery stores. It is definitely, it is definitely new. Ah, yes, right, so um, me, and where does my research fit into this? So in the late 90s, I was um, starting as a master's student at the University of Washington, and I was really interested in pesticides. I grew up in rural southern Virginia. My dad had buddies who were crop dusters. I used to go up on the plains with them. I had dogs that used to run around in the field in front of our house chasing the pesticide spray trucks. So this was something <laughs> that I was always interested in. But at that time, you know, there, were, there weren't organic regulations in place. People weren't really thinking about the general public when they thought about pesticide exposures. They were thinking about farm workers, and for good reason. I mean, it's important to be thinking about farm worker safety when you talk about pesticides. And so what I started working on at that time um, was looking at what's called the take-home pathway of exposure, where a farm worker is out in the field all day, they get pesticides on their clothes and on their boots, they come home, they hug their kids, they walk through their living room. And so we did some interesting research in the Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center where I was working, looking at the concentration of pesticides in farm workers' vehicle dust and then the concentrations in their house dust and finding that they were highly related. We also looked at pesticide metabolite levels in the urine of the farm workers and then also in their kids and saw that those two were highly related. So we were able to kind of document how this pathway was occurring. And so we ended up working with some great community groups out in Yakima and some great farmer organizations and came up with some materials, some cartoons that were distributed in Spanish and English and there were radio ads and house parties and all this cool stuff to translate this research. 
And the reason I bring that up tonight is because that was the start of me getting involved in diet. So I graduated from the master's program in 2000, and I was lucky enough to be hired as a staff scientist with the Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, which I'll just call PNASH from now on. Um, and there was a lot of other research that was going on in that center. And so this is a paper that we wrote while I was working there where we just sort of opportunistically took advantage of a lot of the studies that were going on. And so we decided to compare the pesticide metabolite levels in the bodies of a bunch of different groups of people. So we had farm workers, kids of pesticide applicators, kids of farm workers, kids in farming communities, and some kids in Seattle. And this was the order that we expected their exposures to go in when we started out. It's not what we saw. First of all, the kids of pesticide applicators actually had higher exposures than the farm workers, which surprised us. And then also, during the time of year when they were not actively spraying pesticides in the fields, kids in Seattle had higher exposures than kids living in farming communities, equal to that of kids of farm workers. And we could not figure out why that was. I mean, we knew from our studies that these farm worker kids had reservoirs of pesticide residue in their house dust that their parents were bringing home with them. How could kids in Seattle have equal exposures? Well, the first thing we thought is maybe their parents are using a lot of residential pesticides. Maybe there's a lot of ant infestations. But when we had done this study, we had actually asked parents, do you use residential pesticides? And beyond that, we had crawled around under their sinks looking for pesticides out in their garages, and we just hadn't seen that much evidence of a lot of residential pesticide use. So, scratching my head, this is right as the organic foods are coming into the grocery stores. And I start to think, could it be diet? Could that be what's going on? And so I went back. We had had all the parents of our kids fill out food diaries, saying everything that their kids had eaten in the two days before we took the urine sample. And I noticed that the groups of kids were different. The kids in Seattle were eating a lot more fresh fruits and vegetables than the kids out in the Yakima Valley. And so I went to Dr. Finsky, who was my boss, and I said, this is what I think is going on. And he gave me such an amazing opportunity for a young researcher. He found me $10,000 of grant funding and said, all right, go, go test it out. And I have to say, it's a topic for another talk, but that set me on the path of wanting to be an independent researcher. So I went out, and I stood out in front of the Laurelhurst PCC and the Queen Anne Met Market, and I recruited two groups of 20 kids each whose parents said they either ate all organic food or all conventional food. And then I measured their urinary pesticide levels in a single urine sample collected from each kid. And this is what I found. There were statistically significant differences between the two groups, even in a study that small. We were kind of shocked, to be honest. This, was, this came out in 2003. This was, you know, 10 months after the organic label had come into effect. So I'm going to step out of my timeline for just a second and show you the results of another study that a colleague of mine did three years later. So this work was done by Alex Liu, who was a colleague of mine at Pinash. He used to be a staff scientist there, and now he's a professor at Harvard. And he and his group wanted to make sure that the results that I was seeing weren't because there are other differences between kids who eat organic and kids who eat conventional other than their diets. I mean, we looked for residential pesticides too, but maybe we missed them, or you know, maybe wearing Birkenstocks with socks really decreases your pesticide exposure. You know, we didn't know. And so what he did was he took a group of 23 kids, and again, it's a really small sample size, but where I collected one urine sample, he collected 30. He collected two urine samples every day for 15 days. And these were kids who typically ate conventional food. So we let them eat their regular food, and then he gave them an organic diet. And he watched their pesticide levels drop to nothing. I mean, their levels were literally below the limit of detection. And then he let them go back to their regular diets, and the levels popped right back up. So he was able to say pretty definitively that any exposure these kids had was only coming from their diet. So it was the same house, the same kids, the same footwear, and there were no other differences. So getting back to my timeline, I'm 
Um, 2003, my study came out. I mean, yes, it had drawbacks of being small. I did it on a shoestring budget. I mean, more than half of that budget went towards the lab costs of analyzing those urine samples. And so it got all this attention because even though it was limited in some ways, it was so timely. And so I started getting all these calls from the media, which was so exciting and terrifying. And I was interviewed by the New York Times and NPR and other places. And I, I talked to this woman, this reporter, Carol Yoon at the New York Times for over an hour. I explained to her everything about my study and why I was so excited. And on the day that the paper came out, this was my only quote in the entire article. People want to know, what does this really mean in terms of the safety of my kid? We don't know. Nobody does. <laughs> <sighs> what an expert, right? <laughs> what a contribution to science. Um, so that was the truth, though. I mean, these foods had only been out for less than a year. Nobody knew if there were health benefits. It was something to show that there were exposure differences. But, you know, it bugged me. It bugs me still, clearly. Um, <laughs> and so I did a few other things. I, I worked in a nonprofit for a couple of years. I worked in environmental consulting. And then right around 2008, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I decided to go back to school and get my doctorate, which is what I'm still doing. Um, and so this slide, hmm, I tried to condense the past five years of research down into this slide. Um, the problem with trying to figure out if there's a health effect from eating organic food, first of all, is sample size. You're never gonna answer this question with 23 or 40 kids. You just can't do it. You need thousands of people. And you need to follow them for a long time. And that is too expensive. And the main way that people assess pesticide exposure is by looking at urinary levels. But the problem with that, aside from being expensive, is that that only represents your exposure from like yesterday. And any health effects that you have, it's going to be an effect of cumulative exposure over many years, not just yesterday. So the main part of my dissertation was just to try to come up with a new way of, ex of assessing exposure from your diet that would represent a really long time and would be relatively cheap. So the way that I'm trying to do it, and I think it's working, um, is to take information from people about what they usually eat. How often during a typical week do you eat apples? And then combining that information with a national database about average levels of 450 different pesticides in every food we eat. So the USDA collects over 2 million samples from grocery stores of everything you can think of, measures them for 450 pesticides, and then publishes that annually. So this is a very simplified version of what my dissertation does, but I'm trying to combine those two sources of information and come up with a reliable estimate of your pesticide exposure. So I'm doing this in a population of over 4,000 people. I have all their food diaries. And I also was lucky enough to be able to ask all these people how often they ate organic food, which we know is important to exposure. And so this chart shows the results for the 60% of those 4,000 people who say, oh, I never eat organic food, I don't do that. And so for those people where we can kind of take organic out of the equation, I combine their intake and average pesticide residue levels, and just for simplicity as to not have 100 slides for you, I combine them into three groups. Low predicted exposure, I hardly ever eat fruits and vegetables, medium, and high. And then I took a subset of 500 of them and measured their urinary pesticide metabolite levels. The idea is that even though those metabolite levels only represent a day or two of exposure, if you're a person who usually eats a lot of fruits and vegetables, usually a urine sample is going to be pretty high in pesticides. And so that's what I found. On the unlabeled x-axis here, what we have is your urinary, is urinary metabolite level among the 500 people. And you can see that my estimated exposure and breaking them into high, medium, and low worked pretty well. These are statistically significant differences. And what I'm trying to say is that if you tell me what you eat, I can do a decent job of telling you what your exposure is. And then if I combine that with knowing whether or not you eat organic or how often you eat organic, I can do an even better job. 
And so the next steps for my dissertation, I should have told you in the beginning that I wasn't really gonna answer this question tonight, um, but the next steps are to combine my exposure predictions, which I've generated for everybody, with the results of these neurocognitive tests. So when they look at farm workers who are exposed to pesticides and compare them to a control group, they often see differences in things like memory, executive function, mental processing, all these measures of neurocognition that are not intelligence, they're just sort of how quick your synapses are working. And it just so happens, well it doesn't just so happen, I chose this cohort for this reason, um, they're doing these same tests in these 4,000 people for whom I've predicted exposure. But these aren't farm workers, these are just general public people from six cities across the US. And so I'm gonna be looking at the relationship between the exposures I predicted and all of these health outcomes, considering organic food consumption and accounting for total fruit and vegetable intake. So this brings me to the last part of my talk. At the end of the day, what do we know about the benefits of eating organic food? Okay, so first of all for consumers, and this, this is controversial. Not everybody will agree with me on this statement and maybe not even everybody in this room, but in general, the evidence that organic produce has more nutrients than conventional produce is not compelling. Now there have been some studies that have shown that organic food is lower in nitrates, which is good, and maybe higher in vitamin C and phenols, um, which is also good. But for every positive study you have, you also have one where those effects were not seen. And it's complicated because nutrient content is affected by all of these factors that are variable between all these studies. So if you try to do a meta-analysis and look across all the studies that have been done on nutrient content, it's really hard for it all to be the same. But if you think back to all the things I was just talking about, about what makes something organic, none of those things necessarily suggest that a carrot grown without synthetic fertilizers is gonna have more beta carotene than a carrot that's grown with them. I mean, it's possible the nutrient content in the soil is likely to be higher, it's certainly possible, but I think the evidence isn't there. So if the reason that you would wanna eat organic food is because you think it might have more vitamins and minerals, maybe, maybe not. But I'm sure we can have a lively debate about that. I know there's a lot of different opinions there. Definitely, if the reason you might wanna eat organic food is because you wanna reduce your exposure to pesticides, definitely. 99% of conventional apples test positive for at least one pesticide at the time that they're in your grocery store. Many items contain multiple pesticides. A single grape, this is you know, obviously the highest point, but it's still true. There was a USDA sample that tested positive for 15 different pesticides. So one resource for this, maybe you guys have heard about this, the Environmental Working Group provides this dirty dozen list, which is the 12 most contaminated fruits and vegetables. So if you were gonna selectively choose your fruits and vegetables in order to reduce your exposure, these would be the ones to start with. They also have a clean 15 list, which is exactly like it sounds. And I have the website for this at the end of this talk. Right, so lower exposures, but what does that mean in terms of my health? We don't know, nobody does. Um, <laughs> 10 years later, no, it's, it's, it's not that we don't know more than we did 10 years ago. Um, it is true that to date, no epidemiologic studies have investigated investigated the health benefits of eating organic. But there have been several really good studies that have looked at pesticide levels in um, pregnant women and in young children and have looked at the relationship between those levels and outcomes like ADHD, IQ, and different brain anomalies, different behavioral outcomes all later in life and have seen associations between higher levels of pesticides and those outcomes. And these are pretty low levels of pesticides that they're talking about. They're not that different than what you might get from your diet. But these studies were done in populations that either lived in agricultural communities or lived in cities and high rises where they were using a lot of residential pesticides, they weren't focused on diet. So there's only so much you can draw from those studies. They're certainly suggestive, but they're not conclusive. And then on top of that, 
One study actually showed the opposite. So this is a study that just came out last week. And this was a group of women who were probably not exposed from anything other than diet. And they actually found an association between higher levels of pesticides in the moms and better outcomes in their kids at age 12 to 18 months. The problem is, all the moms with the higher levels of pesticides ate way more fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Those two things are almost perfectly correlated if you're not eating organic. So it's impossible from that study to disentangle the effects of a healthy diet from the effects of pesticide exposure. If we're going to answer this question, we really have to look at two populations, one who's eating organic and one who's eating conventional, who are matched on their fruit and vegetable intake. Oh, and that study just makes me need to make this statement. The health benefits of eating fruits and vegetables outweigh the risks of pesticide exposures from these foods, hands down. If you are figuring out, am I going to feed my kid fruits and vegetables if I can only afford conventional, or am I not going to feed them fruits and vegetables? Feed them the conventional fruits and vegetables. If you go to a dinner party and somebody's serving a salad and it's not organic, don't be the guy that turns it down, and not just because it's bad manners. It's really, you know, the fruit and vegetables outweigh the pesticide exposures. In terms of farm workers, another reason you might choose to eat organic might not be because of your own health benefit, but because you're concerned about risks to farm workers, and it's a good reason. It's a good reason to eat organic. In the U.S. alone, 5.1 billion pounds of pesticides are applied to cropland each year. And it's farm workers who apply these pesticides and who go into the field and pick these foods. Among the estimated 2 million agricultural workers in the U.S., physicians diagnose as many as 10 to 20,000 pesticide poisonings each year. And these are just the ones that are reported, diagnosed, and tracked. It also doesn't account for chronic effects like cancer and Parkinson's. And these pesticides, we know they don't stay at work. They come home with the farm workers on their boots and on their work clothes. So, Farm worker safety alone is a good reason to switch to organic food if you can. And then lastly, the environment. Ecological health is another pretty compelling reason to go organic. We know that organic food reduces waterway contamination, reduces soil and groundwater contamination, improves soil quality and stability, reduces erosion. Organic agriculture employs a lot of crop rotation, which helps sustain biodiversity. It uses less energy, less fossil fuels, produces less waste. And I didn't talk about it tonight, but with the whole livestock piece, it reduces antibiotic resistance. So at the end of the day, if you're going to eat organic, it really comes down to your personal reasons for why you're considering eating organic. I mean, is it because you want to eat more vitamins, or is it because you want to improve ecological health? I mean, only you can weigh that against the extra cost that we know is there for eating organic food. And with that, these are a lot of references from what I talked about tonight. If you want any of these in greater detail, just come talk to me after the talk. And these are two helpful websites. The top one is that link to the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And the bottom one is the American Academy of Pediatrics. They just came out with some great recommendations, which are for pediatricians to tell their patients who are wondering about organic food. If you go to that website and just search organic, you'll find it, and it echoes a lot of what I've talked about here tonight. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you.